Uh, Dr. Christoph Meyer uh, specializes in uh, North American literature, uh, including uh, contemporary Canadian prose. Is this too loud? No? Um, his uh, doctoral dissertation, uh, which he defended in 2008, uh, is titled The Picaro Messiah and the Unworthy Scribe, a pattern of obsession in Mordecai Richler's later fiction. He has also uh, published on the prose of Richler, uh, um, uh, on Mark Anthony German, <coughs> and uh, Ravi H., uh, and also the films of uh, Joel and Ethan Cohen. Uh, he's uh, co edited um, a collection of essays called Tools of Their Tools Communications Technologies, speaking of which, <laughs> Communications Technologies uh, and American Cultural Practice. Uh, he's currently working on his <coughs> Habilitatia, Habilitation, uh, uh, and the title is Art and the Artist in 21st Century Fiction. Uh, Dr. Meyer uh, teaches at the University of Łódź, at the uh, Institute uh, of English or Institute of English, English Studies there. And um, I'm going to um, stop here with the introductions, I think. Uh, the title of the talk, which I think you see displayed, is uh, Zalotaj Fuga. Vladimir Nabokov's Bachmann as musicalized form of fiction. Thank you very much and welcome to the Thank you. Thank you very much. It is great to be here and as you've just heard, there were some technical difficulties. I hope that's the end of technical difficulties for today. I want to start by saying that this is a relatively new project. Um, as you've just heard, I usually work with uh, North American fiction, Canadian fiction, mostly. Uh, this time we're dealing with uh, an author who is, of course, associated with, um, with the United States, but the part of his work that I'm going to talk about today uh, goes uh, much, or is situated much earlier, because the text, Bachmann, uh, a very, um, or relatively unknown, text by Nabokov uh, comes from the 1920s, when uh, Nabokov was a Russian emigre in Berlin. So we're talking about a text which was uh, first written in Russian, uh, published in Germany, and only then made its way into collections of uh, Nabokov's prose. Um, and the other part, so I usually don't work with uh, Nabokov, the other part uh, that is uh, relatively new is um, what you see on the slide here, musicalized fiction. And I want to talk uh, quite a bit about the idea of musicalized fiction, the theory behind uh, musicalized fiction, what it is and how it can be helpful, what the limitations of it are. And then uh, Nabokov's Bachmann uh, is going to be my example, so to speak. So let me, sorry, I think I need to step back a little bit. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> So let me give you an outline of my of my talk. Uh, for the purposes of the of the lecture, I uh, will talk briefly about the idea of the musical fugue, which is crucial to uh, to my talk, and the idea of counterpoint in music. Uh, later, I will talk about musicalization of uh, literature, musicalization of fiction, and the problems that arise, certain tensions in the critical field, because it's not. Um, it's not a level field. Uh, one of the main critics that I'm going to refer to is Werner Wolf, uh, who is an author of uh, the most rigorous uh, model of musicalized fiction, so I will tell you quite a bit about that. Uh, then we will move to the idea of a literary fugue and whether something like this is at all possible, whether it is possible to represent that particular pattern in literature. Then, and you can see this is quite a, uh, a handful, all of this, I hope that we'll manage. Uh, then perhaps problems with um, musical influences in Nabokov's fiction and, and why it is very rarely done. Very briefly, I will mention uh, the novel Pale Fire, which uh, I think you're, you're much more likely to, to have read or heard of uh, Pale Fire than Bachmann, uh, one of the Nabokov's principal works uh, written in, in America in the 60s. And finally, musicalization in Bachmann. So, depending on how uh, much time there is, I will um, devote my attention to, to, to various parts here. We will see how it works out. 
So as I already said, Bachman is an early and seriously unappreciated or underappreciated short story. Usually uh, critics suggest that it's a, it's a piece of juvenilia. It was published even before Nabokov's first novel, which was published in 1926. What I claim, however, is that it is already a mature, rigorously organized modern text and that it anticipates the patterns of uh, Pale Fire, which I consider to be Nabokov's greatest work. Um, I believe that there is structural and thematic fugality in the text, and I will explain that, and that it is strictly related to the non-mimetic, self-reflexive qualities of Nabokov's later fiction. And if you've read Nabokov, then uh, you will certainly recognize these qualities. So let me start uh, by uh, quoting a definition of the fugue, and I will, uh, uh, I will play a fragment in a moment. So the fugue is a form of composition, popular in but not restricted to the Baroque era, in which a theme or subject is introduced by one voice and is initiated by, I'm sorry, and is imitated by other voices in succession. Usually only the first few notes of the subject are imitated exactly, then each voice deviates slightly until the next time it enters again with the subject. Generally, the voices overlap and weave in and out of each other, forming a continuous tapestry-like texture. So the difference between the fugue and another uh, musical work would be that uh, you don't have uh, an accompaniment, you don't have chords underneath, whatever chords arise will be, uh, uh, will, be, um, will be there because of various voices intersecting. It begins with just one line of melody. After a while, this melody is repeated in another key and the two start going together, then a third joins, sometimes a fourth, sometimes a fifth. <coughs> So it is, a, it is an intensely polyphonic form. Um, so another, another uh, uh, term, polyphony, of course, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and counterpoint. So the art of combining two or more melodies to be performed simultaneously and musically. In counterpoint, the melody is supported by another melody rather than by chords. Yes? So you essentially have several melodies happening at the same time. The counterpoint is the art of keeping them harmonious or keeping them together. And I would like to uh, uh, play a very short example uh, of uh, Bach fugue. Johann Sebastian Bach is the composer most associated with, uh, with the form. And uh, I hope that you will be able... Yes, let, let me point it out first of all. If you can see... Uh, sorry. If you can see anything of the notes there, I, I, I don't expect uh, of you to read music, but let me just say that this here and ending here is the, is the subject occurring for the first time. It continues here. It occurs for the second time in another key. The two continue together, and here the third voice appears. And you will hear it in a very clear recording by Glenn Gould, one of the foremost uh, pianists associated with the, with the form. So let me play a fragment. I'll start with just the, uh, just the theme, just the subject, so that you get the... Okay, once again, just the subject. Okay, and now let me show you how they work together. So this is where we are. just from this very short fragment that uh, the original subject reappears 
in different keys, and the other uh, the, uh, the other voices go on and uh, accumulate in this way. difficult to uh, work several different uh, uh, technologies at the same time, as you can see. So, um, let me tell you some more about musical literary analysis. So, this is a relatively recent critical development, and it has raised a lot of doubts. Uh, and the doubts are connected with uh, such ideas as the danger of metaphorical impressionism. Um, the lack in theoretical self-consciousness and uh, the formula which, is, uh, which, which was put by Brown as caveat comparator, so be careful you who seek to compare the two uh, uh, arts, so literature and, and, and music. Uh, what Cher here means by metaphorical impressionism is that certain terms taken from musical theory are transplanted into literary theory and are used as if they have the same meaning. And this is very often not the case, as I will uh, perhaps speak about a little bit later. Such ideas as theme are, for example, very different. A theme in a musical piece is something very different from a theme which can occur uh, in various works of literature, which can occur, which can occur in various uh, traditions of literature. Uh, these terms are not uh, uh, synonymous. So there is a lot of there is a lot of doubt. There is a lot of um, uh, let's say uh, uncertainty connected with the field, and it has to do especially with uh, narrative fiction because. As Werner Wolf um, uh, suggests, uh, lyric poetry has a traditional connection to song and music. So with poetry, uh, um, finding the similarities is easier. With narrative fiction, it gets much more complex. And this is why Wolf suggests that what is needed are rigorous theorizations and highly restrictive criteria of evidence admissibility. So highly restrictive um, uh, sets of criteria for, for determining whether something is a mu musicalized, sorry, fiction or not. Uh, these are several important studies. So Calvin Brown may be uh, considered the founder of uh, uh, musicalization studies, 948. Uh, Werner Wolf, whom I'm going to be mentioning again, again, again and again, uh, the author of Musicalization of Fiction, a study in the theory and history of intermediality. And very recently, Emily Peterman, who wrote uh, the book The Musical Novel, Imitation of Musical Structure, Performance, and Reception in Contemporary, Contemporary Fiction. I'm going to refer to these three. So, uh, what Vol says is that these studies belong to uh, the theory of intermediality. But this uh, term, which I'm sure you're familiar with, is understood here differently. Because what, what Wolf suggests is that intermediality means the participation of more than one medium of expression in the signification of a human artifact. So it's not uh, a, a series of connections that already exist between various media, in his understanding. Not a series of connections, say, between uh, painting and music and literature. But the, uh, the existence of elements of a particular medium in, inside a particular work. So it's a very narrow definition. And he says it's a logical continuation of the interest in intertextuality. And both of these terms are understood very narrowly because uh, uh, for, for Wolf, intertextuality, again, is not an already existing web of connections, but the participation of at least one further text in the signific signification of a particular text, of another text. So, um, for Wolf um, to consider uh, intertextuality, we need to be looking at a particular text and to have either one other text or a series of texts which participate in the first text that we, that we began with. And of course a related, uh, uh, a related uh, subject here is ekphrasis, or the verbalization of a visual work of art in a literary text. 
So according to Wolf, we are uh, living in the, the era of an intermedial turn. So uh, literary studies are taking a turn towards intermediality. And this suggests, in fact, that the verbal medium is far from over or far from dead. I'm sure you've heard various formulations of how literature has been exhausted or, 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 or the, the novel is, um, is more than the novel is dead. Far from it, says uh, Wolf, uh, connections with other media are what feeds literature and feeds um, uh, the written word. So what are the similarities, according to Wolf, um, between music and literature? Both, according to him, are conventionalized human signifying practices, each of which is governed by a grammar, such as generic conventions, the tonal system. But there is a problem, because each of these media has a set of, probably a very large set, of signifiers. Yes, uh, Wolf is a structuralist in the sense that he believes in a very, again, narrow definition of the sign, so he's very concerned with how the signified refers to the signifier. So here uh, he is asking, how, what, what are the relationships between various signifiers in uh, music and, and in literature? So he asks, can discrete signifying units, the smallest signifying units perhaps, of one realm which you can isolate, can they correspond to those of the other realm? Let me give you some examples. Does a movement in a symphony, let's say, which consists of four movements, does a movement correspond to a chapter in the novel? Does a musical phrase correspond to a sentence? Does a chord correspond to a word? Does a note corresponds to a phoneme or grapheme, and furthermore, does it make sense to isolate such small particles? If you take a note out of a theme, does it mean anything on its own? If you take a word out of a text, does it mean anything on its own? So, uh, so how to relate these signifiers one to another is, is the problem that, um, that Wolf faces. But there are similarities, Wolf says, uh, fortunately, otherwise uh, this, this practice would be impossible. So both musical and verbal literary signifiers are originally of an acoustic nature, yes? And they dynamically unfold on the axis of time rather than in space. So unlike painting, for example, yes, literature, Wolf claims, and music occur in time. That is the, that is the similarity, and they, they, they dynamically unfold, they develop. However, as I already said earlier, such uh, terms as theme, motif, dissonance, or rhythm only seem to be to have convergent meaning. Uh, actually, Wolf says, they are at best figurative, and unless you are talking about rhymed poetry or drama, they will become metaphors, they will not be precise. Yes, yeah, so Wolf says that these are heuristic metaphors. And that musicalization, he says, can only at best exist in literature, let alone fiction, in an implicit and indirect mode. Uh, music cannot exist inside uh, a literary work uh, directly. It can only be implied and, and suggested indirectly. Yes. So, as I said earlier, because of all those doubts, Wolf suggests that there needs to be a set of very rigorous criteria for recognizing when musicaliz musicalization uh, takes place in a work of literature. Because of this fear of metaphorical impressionism, of just uh, recording your own impressions of, of the text and the, and the piece of music. So, um, Wolf suggests looking at such things as quality. Is the uh, intermediality, yes, is the connection between the two covert or overt? Covert means indirect, yes, music appears not directly, not as a passage of actual notes, but is uh, suggested or imitated in some way, yes. So, is it covert or is it overt? Is it direct, is it indirect? Very rarely is it direct. Quantity, is it total or partial? Does this intermediality affect the entire literary work or just a fragment of it? Uh, what is the genesis of this intermediality? Is it authorized or non-authorized? In other words, does it, and this will sound very old-fashioned, I'm sure, to your ears, does it originate with the author of the text 
Or is it perhaps added on to a particular edition of the work, literary work? Uh, let me give you an example. If um, a novel, let's say, is brought out in a different edition with a set of songs based on the novel written and recorded by someone else, that will also have to be considered under the rubric of musicalization, but it will be non-authorized as not coming from the original source. And then also intensity. How intense is this intermediate co connection uh, in, in the work? Uh, it can be contiguous, where the two exist side by side, or it can be integrated. This is again very rare. Perhaps happens in, in opera or in a musical, where you can say that the two media exist inside one work. So what we're interested in most of all is this covert or in, indirect intermediality. And this again uh, can work in two different ways. One is thematization or telling. That means there are references to musical works in the text. The one that is more interesting though, and the one that I want to talk about, is imitation or showing, as, as Wolf says. So ways in which a literary text can imitate a work of music. The criteria, Wolf says, are not absolute, they are a continuum, so you're, you, you don't have to uh, necessarily use all of them. But, and I've already suggested it uh, earlier, uh, there is the problem with intentionality. For Wolf, in order to analyze a work in this way, you need to have, uh, you need to be certain, or at least it needs to be probable, that there was an intention of musicalization in the text. That means that musicalization is not a phenomenon, but it is a process. It is something that a work undergoes, and it does it uh, in a way that is intentional. Again, very uh, old-fashioned, but Wolf can be worked with. It's a model that can be uh, applied and, and adapted. So as I said, the most interesting thing is imitation, or showing how a literary work can imitate uh, a, a particular work of music or, or music. And this is how he explains it. It's an iconic similarity between parts of a work characterized by one medium and, on the other hand, another medium. There are certain linguistic means, literary techniques, which imply, evoke, imitate, or otherwise indirectly approximate actual music. And what are the results of imitation? Wolf says we can have word music. This, he says, is very rare and actually happens only when a work is read aloud. This is when, in the reading of the work, actual music appears. The music can be heard, or certain musical qualities can be heard. Music appears as a textual signifier. More frequent, but still not as interesting to Wolf, are imaginary content analogies. So music evokes certain visual images. Uh, an example would be a character in a novel who is thinking about a piece of music and recording, a character or, or a narrator, recording his or her impressions. So I'm listening to a piece of music and it reminds me of, um, I don't know, a swan on a lake or something like this. But as Wolf says, these images they are imaginary and they are analogies. The, the, the content is not there, it is imagined content, associated content. And finally, what interests uh, Wolf and myself the most are formal and structural analogies. So imitations of particular microforms, such as polyphony, variation, modulation, or macroforms, such as musical genres, the sonata or, or the fugue. So how to recognize a musical fiction? Uh, Wolf says uh, there are certain uh, telling uh, signs. The acoustic foregrounding, as we already mentioned, but this will only happen when heard. More importantly, self-referentialization. Uh, Wolf observes that these um, uh, works of literature will show a tendency towards pattern, a tendency toward self-reflexivity, uh, uh, to, towards um, well, there would be departures from referential or grammatical consistency and narrative plausibility. In other words, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the plot of the novel might seem less probable, less uh, convincing, there will be something that is a little off. There will be um, um, this, this, this sort of postmodern uh, uh, play uh, of, of reference. So the work's discourse and or story elements, including the imagery, will betray a marked tendency towards the formation of patterns and recurrences. 
um, on the phonological, syntactic, semantic, or thematic levels, thus producing an unusual self-referentiality. And Wolf says it is very important that these elements, these patterns, uh, that, that, that these elements uh, are not, um, or you are not able to explain them in any other way. You are not able to relate them to the plot. They seem to be something imposed from the outside. In other words, they do not make sense plot-wise. Yes, significant departures from mimetic heteroreferentiality or re references to the outside world, from a narrative consistency and plausibility, uh, and sometimes even from grammatical correctness. This is what may occur in a work of this kind. And um, I don't want to go into all of these details here. Volt is very rigorous in, in setting out the criteria. He is interested in the range of intermediate co collections, uh, the frequency, the reli reliability of the speaker, whether uh, it is the author or a narrator or character, whether they have a particular metafunction, whether they also refer to the, uh, to the rest of the work or perhaps the rest of the, of the writer's um, over. And Wolf says it's important that they have a cumulative effect. You don't take one particular criterion, but rather you look at how they work cumulatively. And the result is, again, defamiliarization. So the text will become opaque. Uh, this is the, the, um, uh, the least that can happen. It will, it will become opaque, it will become difficult to read. It might, might even become alienating impossible to read. In fact, what Wolf claims is that musicalization of narrative fiction can never be fully attained, it can only be approximated, because a fully musicalized text would be incomprehensible, because the signifiers of uh, music would simply have replaced the signifiers of literature. So it's a sort of utopian ideal, this musicalization of fiction. It can, it can happen in degrees, let's say. It cannot be completed. So what are the problems with Wolf? And I'm sure that you've already noticed some of those. Uh, his primary point of reference is Western non-monodic or non-monophonic uh, instrumental music of the past three centuries. Classical music, in fact. This is what he's interested in the most. Why? Perhaps because classical music has produced recognizable forms. Forms which have survived for centuries uh, they've, of course, undergone development, but they, they have a certain strict form which can be observed. So classical music and time-honored forms such as the fugue, the sonata, the symphony, or the string quartet, this is what Wolf works with. And it's interesting to look at the writers that he works with as well. Uh, De Quincey, Joyce, Huxley, Wolf, Beckett, Burgess, Josipovici, M many of those are canonical British modernist writers not to mention most of them are male, all of them are white. Uh, it's a very restrictive uh, selection of text. So, uh, Wolf is in fact working with very rigorous methods, taking as his point of reference very rigorous forms from classical music and applying those to a certain safe canon of modernist, uh, chiefly British writing. And that is a problem. So that's why uh, Emily Peterman, who published uh, her book uh, just last year, uh, chooses to update this model. And she says that the, the model can be applied to other intermedial phenomena. And she, for example, introduces jazz, uh, which Wolf practically ignores. He's not interested in what happens when jazz meets uh, uh, literature. And to ignore that is, of course, to ignore at least 60 or 70 years of the history of, for example, American literature to ignore such things as the Beat Generation, let's say, or the novels of Toni Morrison, uh, or Stanley Crouch, or Michael Ondaatje, that's a Canadian writer, of course. So, uh, so Peterman opens this model up, and she also introduces diverse literary traditions, nationalities, and ethnicities, makes it more interesting. So, is a literary fugue at all possible? Let me remind you, the fugue is uh, several voices occurring at the same time, playing together in different keys. Can this be done? So Brown says in 1948 that it is seldom attempted, and it seldom happens in literature. And it's true that most examples here will come from the second part of the century, so after Brown's uh, study was published. 
In poetry, of course, the most famous example is Paul Celan, Todes Fuga, Todes Fuga, sorry, the, the Death Fugue. Uh, but we're talking about narrative prose here, so the earliest examples would be fragments from Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern, especially the Lily Bolero episode, or De Quincey. These are two earlier examples. But uh, where, where this is the strongest would be certain episodes from Ulysses, the Sirens episode, uh, Thomas Pynchon's short story Entropy, which has a very strong uh, fugal component, uh, a short story by Joseph Vici entitled Fuga, or Fuga, uh, William Gass's A Fugue. So you will notice that very often you can see the form in the title, because the reference will be, um, let's say, uh, obscure enough so that without this particular pointer from the writer, it may be difficult to um, notice it. So writers often feel compelled to say outright that they will be imitating a fugue, and the, and the text is very often called the fugue of, uh, of this or another kind. Okay. So why is the fugue so attractive? Because I, I believe that still, uh, there are quite a few examples there. Um, so, according to Brown, it is the most intellectual or mu of, musical, of musical forms. Intellectual because it takes a particular skill to be able to keep track of the several voices which uh, uh, occur at the same time. Also, uh, it seems to have a stabilizing effect, an association with safety and order, because by the end, uh, of these these voices, which undergo various um, uh, undergo variations, they uh, collide. They often produce controlled dissonance. At the end, usually in a Bach fugue, everything will end in one harmonious chord, which will resolve the dissonances. One of the most effective devices known for building up a climax and its attendant excitement, uh, um, one of the uh, one of the uh, theoreticians also says. Uh, because, well, you can, you can see how, the, how this development uh, happens, because each of the voices joining uh, creates complexity and, and creates uh, tension. So, yes, so uh, there's the final chord at the end. Um, there's a tension between order and disorder, which is very productive. Furthermore, uh, theoreticians of music also talk about narrativity in the fugue. There's a certain um, a narrative quality. Musical polyphony may be read as a dialogue or a contest between voices or perhaps characters who are in conflict or in harmony with each other. Yes. The Latin word for fugue is flight or escape. And uh, according to Wolf, um, what the fugue is most able to, um, uh, uh, to imitate is a kinetic state, movement. Uh, here, of course, there's a separate set of problems. Does music ever mean anything at all? There's a, that's a separate problem that we won't go into now. Perhaps we might in questions after why, uh, afterwards. Uh, what music is able to do is certainly it is able to evoke certain states or emotions. Whether it can mean something is, is debatable. Uh, but it can have a semblance of narrativity. Uh, so let's recapitulate. Let's see what we have here in the few. We have an intellectually charged narrative. We have multiple voices or even characters. We have a relationship with, which oscillates between harmony and conflict. We have tension. We have release or climax. We have everything that is necessary for uh, uh, a traditional literary narrative. Um, I wanted to play a fragment. I don't know how we're doing for time. Uh, it's probably too late to do this. Uh, so I will just read a fragment um, from Glenn Gould, the pianist that you've heard before. Uh, he talks about why the fugue continues to fascinate uh, composers, musical composers. And he says, I think it has something to do with the very special need that certain types of artists exhibit, a need to prove that what they do is valid, that it is not achieved by random selection, that every moment flows logically from the moment before to the moment after. And contrapuntal forms, fugues and canons, and so on, are like that. Either a canon works or it does not work. And in the same way, the fugue is a process which is about process. This is a crucial um, quote here. 
really it concentrates on process and one is not likely in a fugue to be seduced by the momentary attraction or distraction of a particular idea. A process which is about process. This must certainly sound familiar uh, uh, in the field of um, uh, literary theory. Yes. Metatextuality, self-reflexivity. So, of course, there's the, there's the fugue's narrative potential. There are these self-reflexive metamusical trappings because the, the fugue is in itself very self-reflexive in that the same subjects reappear, they are changed, they are very often, uh, they very often mirror each other, they are inverted, they are played back to forth. All kinds of variations occur there, but there is, it, it relates to itself again and again. So this, of course, would appeal to a particular kind of literary temperament, someone who is obsessed with stylistic virtuosity, hyper-intricate patterning and tensions between reality and artifice. So in short, to someone like Vladimir Nabokov. I have more here, but well, I think I will skip that. There are some examples of how the fugue has continued to be uh, interesting to composers um, in, in the 20th century. I don't know how many of you are interested in uh, contemporary or 20th century classical music, but well, there are quite a lot of names. For those of you who are interested, you will note that most of the, uh, the avant-garde composers of the 20th century are here. Schoenberg, Webern, Ives, Berg, Shostakovich, Stravinsky, Bartok in the mid, perhaps less so. So, uh, just to briefly uh, uh, talk about what is here, um, Wolf claims, and I agree, that music is the other of traditional mimetic literature. When, when music collides with mimetic literature, the disorder in uh, a literary work increases. And, as we said earlier, once this disorder reaches a particular point, the work becomes incomprehensible. But two interesting things happen at the same time in the 20th century, I would say. In music, there's a renewed interest in the fugue and counterpoint among avant-garde composers. And in fiction, because fiction emancipates itself uh, from uh, the, 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 the canons of realism, let's say, or romanticism in some, uh, uh, in some uh, examples, uh, the ground is ripe for those two things to come together. And modern fiction begins to open itself to experiments in musicalization. That is, relations with a predominantly a-referential or a-referential art. Art which does not refer to anything apart from itself. Okay, so there are again several problems. How to imitate this pluridimensionality, the things happening at the same time in a, uh, in a text, in a literary text. Uh, Wolf observes, and I'm sure you know, that the reading process is inevitably linear. However we arrange text on the page, we are able to look at it, we are able to take in the text, even if it is arranged in a, in a, in a pattern, circular pattern. But if we want to read, we will probably have to proceed from one word to another. There is something that is inevitable here. So how does it happen? You can alter the typography, for example. This is what John Barth did in The Floating Opera. You have two columns of text, uh, which begin in the same way, but then diverge. If you just take a, uh, a, a glance at what is going on here, you will notice that somewhere, oh, sorry, somewhere around here, until you've got the knack, separate them ever so gradually, part them very carefully until, and so on. Uh, Barth here demands of the reader to be able to hold these two texts in his mind at the same time. Is it possible? I suppose not. I suppose even if you do take him up on it, you will be reading at best in this way. Yes, you will be reading the two interchangeably. What happens in the few is that they exist at the same time. So there's a, there's a problem which is probably uh, uh, impossible to, to uh, to evade. Uh, what you could also do is you could have a continuous passage and you could have uh, changes in typeface, for example. You could have uh, several voices or themes occurring at the same time, as happens in William Gass's uh, Fugue. I've underlined certain elements which reappear. This does not occur in the original text. Uh, and then also, you are expected to read the text and to make the connections 
in your head. This is what Wolf, in fact, says. Uh, textual polyphony is illusory because the juxtaposition or synopsis of plurality has to take place in the reader's mind. You have to connect these things into a whole. Okay. Um, I think we will have to, yes, I have to uh, move on to Nabokov. So there are, there's, there's more there. We can talk about it afterwards. So Nabokov and music, there is a problem here. Why? Because Nabokov very rarely refers to music um, in a straightforward manner. There are several short stories, apart from Bachmann, uh, such as Sounds, Music, or The Assistant Producer, where it is a subject. But, and, and also musical motifs have been found in various novels, uh, such as Pale Fire, Ada, or Lolita, some of the most famous novels. But they are never the main theme apart from Bachmann. And also, Vladimir Nabokov, apparently, we trust his son, never professed a special love for music. Actually, what he said was, I have no ear for music, a shortcoming I deplore bitterly. Or he said, although both my parents had absolute pitch, music, I regret to say, affects me merely as an arbitrary succession of more or less irritating sounds. So, uh, this is not very encouraging uh, for, for, a, for a researcher. Fortunately, uh, if you've read a little Nabokov, then you know better than to trust what he says at any given point. Because elsewhere, he says something like this, I am perfectly aware of the many parallels between the art forms of music and those of literature, especially in matters of structure, but what can I do if ear and brain refuse to cooperate? Um, so there's, there's a bit of coyness, perhaps uncharacteristic for Nabokov here. But there is enough of a knowingness about this passage. He is perfectly aware of the many parallels in terms of structure. These are not things that are, that are so obvious to, um, uh, to, to someone who is a casual, um, let's say, uh, you know, who, who is an amateur in, in, in that. So there's a knowingness there. But we need not trouble ourselves with um, intentionality, contra uh, to, what Wolf's, to what Wolf says. So I choose to read the book of against his own highly unreliable and often deliberately duplicitous statements. Because I claim in a number of ways, both formal and thematic, Bachmann imitates a fugue, and in that respect, it prefigures Pale Fire. And we don't have time, again, to talk about how this all works out in Pale Fire. I had much more here. Um, we'll move on straight to, um, straight to Bachmann. This is a story that is a mere nine pages. And the uh, extent to which it has been uh, ignored um, is such that it was published only once, uh, um, actually, it, it was published twice, but it was published once uh, when it first came out in 924, and then reprinted in Vogue, just once, and then included in only one out of eight collections of Nabokov's short stories. So it's not a text that you will uh, come upon very often. The story is very straightforward on the face of it. It's a tragic relationship between a genius or eccentric pianist composer, Bachmann, his admirer and lover, Madame Perov, and his impresario, Sack. What happens is, Madame Perov dies, Bachmann goes mad, and Sack prospers. This is the long and short of it. The story is told by Sack to the narrator proper, as a separate uh, character, who retells it to the reader. And Nabokov himself uh, said in a note on the text, I am told that a pianist existed with some of my invented musicians' peculiar traits, and there is, in fact, a historical figure called Vladimir de Pachmann, we will not trouble ourselves with him for the moment. So what happens in Bachmann? There are general, there's general thematizations, or, or, or there's, there are references to music in general, in fragments such as this. The golden throb of Bachmann's deep and demented music is being preserved on wax, as well as being heard live in the world's most famous concert halls. Or there are descriptions of Bachmann's performances with such comments as such beauty, such frenzy, the, the play is still more beautiful, still more frenzy. General references to music, but also specific references to particular works of music which do not exist. They exist only in the world of this particular story. There's a triple fugue. There's a symphony in D minor and, in D minor and several complex fugues. There's the so-called golden fugue, Zolotaya Fuga, which I've used for my title. 
and the final unfinished work composed on the night before Madame Perrault dies. But this, is, this may occur in any text, references to, uh, to music, so more interesting things go on here. Uh, the title is interesting in itself. Bachmann seems to call for a symmetrical reading. Uh, equal emphasis on Bach and Mann, perhaps. The story was, uh, was written in Berlin. Um, so this would suggest tension between art and life, yes, the ideal and the human, aesthetics and ethics, all of these can be productively pursued when reading the, the novel. The tragedy in the text occurs because Sack, the impresario, treats the artist and his muse in an inhuman way, like an object. Uh, Bachmann is served up to the audience, I quote here from the text, consigned like an object to Sack's assistance. Uh, Madame Perov is forced to appear in the audience so that Bachmann will perform at all. As you can see, this does suggest a certain theme which is very familiar. Um, uh, a romantic motif of the misunderstood artist or an artist who is somehow exploited by the bourgeoisie. Nabokov was 25 when he wrote, he was very young, so you would expect from him a, a rather idealistic, straightforward take on this uh, motif, but this is not what happens, I claim. So the story is formally modern. Uh, it has a Conradian frame because uh, there is the outside narrator, yes, there, there, there is the story, the events of the affair, which are told by Sack to the narrator proper, who then tells uh, the events to us. So, of course, each of the narrators imposes uh, his own take on it. And this suggests two very different readings of the story, because it is possible that the sensitive narrator proper sees something that Sack does not see in the events that he tells. And he sees Sack as callous and uncomprehending, and uh, as someone who, uh, uh, who misuses the artist. Or else, the narrator proper could be a sentimentalist, who, and this is a quotation from Brian Boyd, milks every drop of tenderness he can from the un ungainly relationship of Bachmann and Madame Perov. There is radical uncertainty here. Um, still more interesting. Uh, there are, what we said earlier, would be um, referred to as imaginary content analogies. So, uh, for example, there's a fragment which describes what occurs in a fugue, and let me just uh, point out several uh, little things. Um, in his triple fugue, that's in the middle here, in his triple fugue, Bachmann would pursue the theme gracefully, passionately toying with it, he would, pretend, he would pretend he had let it escape, then suddenly he would overtake it with a triumphant swoop. So let me remind you that the fugue, the idea of the fugue is flight or escape. So there is plenty of that, pursuing, escaping, overtaking. And there is quite a lot of uh, musical uh, uh, terminology here. Counterpoint, dissonant chords, uh, harmonies, triple fugue theme, but it very quickly gives way to these almost poetic uh, renditions of what it seems happens in a fugue, if something happens at all. So can Bachmann be thought of as a triple fugue? I would suggest that there are two ways in which you can go about suggesting this fugal structure. It could be horizontal. We have three subjects. We have three characters, Bachmann, Madame Perov, and Sack, who can be read as musical subjects, and I'll explain why in a moment. Or it can happen vertically. There are three levels on which the story occurs, and each of them can be thought of as a separate voice. All of this taken together uh, in counterpoint. So, of course, there is pursuit, because Bachmann is an artist figure who pursues the essence of music, he is pursued by the two other characters, but for different reasons. Madame Perov is in love with him, Sack is pragmatic, he wants to, uh, he wants to um, exploit him. The word pursue, of course, appears in the, in the quoted passage. There are other uh, words which also suggest a similar family uh, of terms. For example, the story begins with, there was a fleeting mention in the newspapers not long ago that uh, the pianist had died. The pursuit is often literal. Bachmann literally escapes the concert stage or the hotel and disappears in bars. The other two characters have to look for him. 
Madame Perov, at some point, does not appear in the auditorium where she has to sit for Bachmann to perform, so Sack has to go and fetch her. He needs to find her. Together they look for, for Bachmann. Several bizarre configurations uh, occur here. And you have a sense over these nine pages of text that these characters are constantly looking for each other, uh, following each other, or escaping uh, one another. Yes. There are playful allusions to, to fugality. For example, Sack says, everybody in the audience had a cold. You know how it is. Let one person clear his throat, and right away, several others join in. Um, yes. So the very similitude, the probability of these events, is already very strained by all of this uh, um, running around, let's say. But there is another blow that the story suffers, and I will relate it to, to musicality, of course. There is an obsessive recurrence of the number three, unsurprisingly, since we're dealing with, dealing with a triple fugue. So, for example, three admiring ladies laugh in unison when Madame Perov mistakes uh, Sack for Bachmann. Bachmann adjusts his piano seat, appeals to it in three languages. The reactions of three national audiences are described uh, the strange liaison between Bachmann and Madame Perov lasts three years. Her illness commences three days before the concert while a party of three is seeking Bachmann. Two or three also occurs a lot. Madame Perov waits two or three days for Bachmann to cure the after effects of alcohol abuse. The pianist makes two or three ridiculous pas in front of the audience. Two or three is important because the whole affair is a menage a trois with the husband. Uh, not really minding the affair between Perov and Bach. So two or three is, is central. There are groupings of three adjectives which occur three times in the text. Benevolent, brilliant, and disagreeable, cranky, capricious, grubby, bleary-eyed, dirty, colorless. There's a trifold mirror in which Madame Perov looks at herself in the third paragraph, no less. So of course, whenever mirrors appear in a literary text, uh, chances are that my nieces, you know, my mi m m a mimetic uh, relationship, relationships will be strained. So the mirror often is forced to reflect itself and reveal some illusory depths. So of course you know, if you've read the book, you know that he's a past master of mirrorings, doublings, inversions. Uh, among his favorite books was, for example, Through the Looking Glass, Alice, Alice in Wonderland. There are musicalized passages, I'm, I'm almost finishing here, um, musicalized passages um, which are difficult to explain otherwise. This is supposedly uh, a normal conversation between Perov and Sack in a supposedly traditional realist text. So what Madame Perov says, so he's back at the hotel now, so we passed each other on the way, and Sack replies, the hell with hotels, he's in some bar, some bar, some bar. Uh, so we have repetitions, we have alliteration, we have rhythm and rhyme, the hell with hotels. We have intrusive tripling again, some bar, some bar, some bar, and defamiliarization, because this fragment of the text begins to sound very strange. If you look at the Russian text, I'm going to subject you to it for a moment, it works even better. It's all the more um, uh, rhythmic. Tak znaczyć on się czas doma, znaczyć my razy chalis, kakoje tam czert doma, w kabakie, w kabakie, w kabakie. Okay? This is a prose text. Nothing suggests a, a, a poetic uh, intrusion here. There are other examples of this kind. I don't have the time for this. Um, so, uh, this I'm going to let go as well. Uh, it's interesting about Nabokov that he often color codes <coughs> Uh, occurrences in his text. So one other pattern that appears in the text is colors, violet, black, gold. What is important here is that is gold is specifically reserved for the area of art and music. That is why the fugue perhaps is a golden fugue. It's a water ya fuga. So conclusions. I claim that Bachmann, this story that is almost never anthologized, almost never mentioned, is not a piece of juvenilia. What it is, is a highly organized, rigorously patterned example of modern musicalized fiction. And I would claim that it features formal and structural analogies, horizontal, horizontally and vertically. It has general and specific thematization, both to music in general and to particular works. 
um, of the intertextual variety. It comes both from the narrator and from the, from the characters. There is iconic imitation of musical material. We have all those characters chasing one another. And we also have Nabokov's paratextual comments, if we really need them, where he says there was a, uh, there was a pianist uh, with uh, similar traits. So this results in considerable self-referentialization, a certain defamiliarization, some bars, some bars, some bars, for example, departures from hetero-referentiality. By the time you've stopped reading this story, you will have to wonder about the events described and how it all uh, holds together. So this approximation of fugal form advances qualities which are associated with Nabokov's later work. So they're non-mimetic, self-reflexive. Um, so this cerebral quality of the few, this intellectual quality of the few, especially as associated with Johann Sebastian Bach, this process which is about process, as Len Gould said, is a perfect analogue to Nabokov's supremely intellectual works. Um, you may know that uh, one of the most famous works by uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, The Art of the Fugue, um, features his musical signature. His own name appears musically. The B A C, or in German tradition, it will be B A C H. In English, it will be B A C B. In fact, but still, uh, the, the signature appears there. So it's easy to see the analog between that and Nabokov's own appearances in his own text, his own haunting of of of, of his texts. So in these various pursuits, crisscrossings, multiplications, and mirrorings, I claim Bachmann is a predecessor to Pale Fire, and it deserves more critical attention. And I'm sorry for speeding. There was much more, uh, um, you know, material. It never works out time-wise, but I'd like to thank you for your attention.